it's not too crowded but the parking lot it was so stressful I thought for sure I'd be late I had to drive around 15 times to find a spot I'm hungry uh, no I don't know I just know my heart's racing and I really really wish that I could just calm down for once you know monkey mind can kill a person Sometimes it feels that way when you're highly sensitive. Hi, I'm Elaine Friend, and I want to welcome you to this talk on highly sensitive people. And if you're here, you probably know someone who's just too damn sensitive. I'm one of them. Highly sensitive people are 20% of the population. That's more than the number of people that live in China, almost 1.6 billion and growing people in the world have a brain that's more highly reactive and I'm one of them. It's a trait sensitivity. We call it sensory processing sensitivity. That's the trait that a person is born with if they are a highly sensitive person. It's not a disorder. It's not a mental illness. It's not neuroticism and it's not even introversion. It's just that certain parts of the brain work a little more reactively than other parts. So we're born with it and it's something that can't be changed. Uh-oh. Um, I'm Elaine Friend, and I work closely with Elaine Aaron, who's the author of the book, The Highly Sensitive Person. We often teach and speak together. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about Elaine Aaron because she discovered the trait. And um, she and I were horse buddies at the barn. And uh, one day she came up to me and said, Elaine, you're a highly sensitive person. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I've been told my whole life, thank you very much hypersensitive, overly sensitive, just too sensitive. But turns out that I do this special kind of therapy called equine assisted psychotherapy and she thought that would be great for HSPs, the nickname. And so I went home, I'd never even heard, I didn't know my friend Elaine was famous, and I'd never even heard the term highly sensitive person when this happened. So I went home and I Googled her and found out that she was literally the author of the term as well as several books on the topic. And um, from there we developed curriculum together and I became an expert in this field and it's changed my life and I'm forever grateful. So here's what she did. Elaine was in therapy one day and her therapist said, you're highly sensitive. And she went home and she started thinking about that. And then she started, she was at UC Santa Cruz. And she put flyers up all over campus saying, do these things um, resonate with you? If so, give me a call, I'd like to interview you. So she initially interviewed about 60 people and for two and three hours apiece, and she found a lot of similarities. So since then, the Aarons, um, her husband and, and her are both research psychologists and they started doing a ton of research and they looked over research for the last basically hundred years and they found evidence of this trait of high sensitivity in 15 to 20 percent of over a hundred species and basically there are two strategies in the world and this is what you can find in all these different species the first one is do it right and do it once so these are the highly sensitive people. They think before they act. Even the kindergartner who shows up to school the very first day, and they'll stop in the doorway and look around the classroom. Oh, what's over there? Oh, who's playing there? Mm, I smell something. Is there cooking? Am I going to cook? Are we going to get to eat? Is it sweet? It's not just if you're in the go for it. If you're wrong, you just do it again strategy, which is the kindergartner who gets to the front door and runs in and starts playing with the trucks right away. And so the teacher might walk over to the door of the kindergarten and say, oh, is he shy? And in fact, the parent might say, no, he's not shy. He just likes to get the lay of the land before he jumps in. Can anybody relate to that? So, um, we need both kinds of people, and, and we think that that is why we've evolved to have about 20% of almost every species probably have this trait, this more reactive brain. So a lot of times we think that the highly sensitive people are introverted, that they don't want to go out and be in the world. And you can't really tell by looking, necessarily. You can't tell by her um, whether she's an introvert or an extrovert. but 
70% of highly sensitive people are introverted and 30% are extroverted. But I like to use these words as verbs. So, you know, I am introverted, but today I'll be extroverting here on stage. But I had to do a lot of self-care to be able to do that. And that's what both introverts and extroverts need. Now, here's an old study, 1968, Thomas and Birch found that 65% of children fit into these three distinct types. The 40% are easies. You've heard of easy babies. Oh, an easy toddler, an easy child. Oh yes, she's so easy. Those are not the highly sensitive people. <laughs> so 15% are the slow to warm up and 10% are difficult. And we can call these highly sensitive children and adults orchids. The research on animals, these are just three distinct studies that give us a really good idea. And um, so the fruit flies, sitters versus rovers. So in the presence of food, some fruit flies will sit and some are zipping all over the place. So it turns out, this is kind of crazy and hard to believe, but I promise it's, it's true. The sitters have more neural complexity than the rovers. They're thinking before they go zipping to the food. The pumpkin seed sunfish, they're in a, um, in a pond studied by biologists at Cornell, and they identified two different categories of these fish, bold and timid. And it turns out that the bold ones were the ones who were less responsive to novel things. So if there's a trap in the pond that wasn't there before, 80%, 80 to 85% of the pumpkin seed sunfish just swam right into the trap and got trapped. And 15 to 20% said, there's something new. Let me hesitate and stay back from the trap. So sometimes we might say, I might say, careful or impulsive. Primates, there's of course lots and lots of studies on primates because their brains are more similar to ours and um, the, the uh, behavioral psychologists and re biologists like to really look at primates in comparison to people. And so with the um, rhesus monkeys and many different primates, they've identified about 15 to 20% are called uptight versus laid back. And again, more and less responsive to their environment. So how do you figure out if someone's highly sensitive? We use this acronym, DOES, D-O-E-S. So D is depth of processing. We are deep processors, deep thinkers. We think maybe a little too much. Sometimes I say, yeah, you know, I could let go of the D for a while. Yes, the highly sensitive people really probably are the first to notice that, um, you know, there's issues with the climate or um, the highly sensitive child is the one who notices every little piece of litter, but mom wishes we could just get to school rather than stopping to pick it up. They're thinking, highly sensitive people are thinking and processing deeply all the time. And because of that, they can become more easily overstimulated, which is the O. Now, everyone has an optimal level of arousal. That's when you're just your best self. You're not overly tired, you're not overstimulated, you're not anxious, your heart rate is what feels best to you. And optimal level of arousal is different for everyone, right? Under arousal, we know from the research, is not good. It can be boredom or isolation. Um, it can really shut you down. And, but I would just say, over arousal is the struggle for most highly sensitive people. And really, it's the only negative aspect of being highly sensitive, is that feeling of being overstimulated. It makes you feel like you just can't function. And we tend to go there easily. And it means that we need more time. All that deep processing, we need to spend time taking care of ourselves in order to not be overstimulated all the time. E is emotionally reactive. And it also means empathy, because if you're having a lot of emotions, you're probably having empathy for others, often the underdog, be it the planet or the children or um, people who are struggling in a way that you're not struggling. Well, all that empathy and strong emotional reactions, because if you think deeply, you're gonna have strong emotional reactions about things. All of that can also be overstimulating, it's challenging. And I always wanna say to the parents who are listening, we can't expect our highly sensitive children to have empathy toward their younger siblings. No, that's not where empathy shows up because they're probably overstimulated by their siblings. But you will find that they have empathy for the puppy 
or um, for younger children or the child in their classroom who's struggling more than they are. S is sensitivity to subtle stimuli. We notice every little thing. The lights are too bright, the temperature changed, the tag in the clothes. Oh, you can, and I'll just give you a moment to think about all the little things that you notice. The highly sensitive person is the person who walks into the room and notice that if the blinds were just lowered a little bit, the sun wouldn't be in that person's eyes. Or that if they just cracked the window in the car, everybody would be more comfortable. They're noticing every little thing. At the same time, when the water bottles, in the case of Perrier from Trader Joe's, are tinkling in the back and banging against each other, the highly sensitive person can't drive another block if they are sensitive to sound. And we're all as, we have as many different ways to be sensitive as we have highly sensitive people. Okay, look at the jellyfish and see if you can find the hot air balloon. I'll give you just a few seconds. I'm moving on because I want to increase your stress. So it's found, one of the ways that our brains are more reactive is in visual scanning. So we are more able to perform higher on visual scanning tests, but we have a higher perceived stress. And if visual scanning, while you're listening to a presentation, makes you feel a little overstimulated, you're going to perform less well. But in optimal conditions, you're going to really be able to function highly because a um, highly sensitive person brain has better visual scanning ability and discrimination. So where's the turtle? It's all the way to your left, about three up from the bottom. Those were not pictures that were used in actual research on HSPs, but it's a quick and easy way for you to see it. So more activation in the brain in making fine visual distinction. And this study, this research has been replicated many, many times. So are there any scientists listening here? People who really want to know the nitty gritty details? Because the, the research on the brain is fascinating. So here is a picture that was actually used in one of the studies. And you're looking for what is the difference between the two pictures. And I know whenever I've um, been presented this research, I could never see that um, the one on the right is missing a fence post. But highly sensitive people tend to see it more than the other 80%. So these are the areas in which we have more visual uh, brain activation, secondary visual areas, visual association areas, and visual motor coordination areas. What that means is it's really important that 80% of stimulation comes in through the eyes. And it can be really overstimulating to always have your eyes open out in the world. So I gave you this picture of my uh, therapy horses with their eyes closed because they really know how to take care of themselves. And I just wanna invite everyone who's here on live stream or in the room to take a few seconds to just go ahead and close your eyes. When you close your eyes, it doesn't matter what you do with your brain. You're welcome to think or just notice what you're hearing or feel your body in the chair, or take a few breaths. All that matters is that sometimes you close your eyes. So I like to give highly sensitive people, and you're welcome to, to do the entire rest of the presentation with your eyes closed um, if you're feeling overstimulated. I like to give you a, a little helpful hint. Here's an example. Every time you open your car door, or you're about to open your car door, you could close your eyes for 10 to 30 seconds. So when you're getting ready to go somewhere, you open the door, you get in, you sit down in the driver's seat, and close your eyes for a little bit. Or maybe when, you're, when you arrive, and uh, one time I mentioned this to somebody, and they came back to me and they said they were, they were closing their eyes for 10 minutes somehow, the translation got switched in their, um, in their mind. And she said, it's just making me late everywhere. And in fact, it doesn't, have, it doesn't matter how long it is. It just matters that you close your eyes a little bit and give your brain and all that visual activation a rest. Here's a really interesting study, and I, I'm giving you, I'm scratching the surface of the, the brain research on highly sensitive people. Um, some of how we've gotten this is uh, they're doing, the scientists are doing a lot of functional MRIs of the brain while people are doing tasks. So this was looking at um, people in Asia and people in America. It's not um, necessarily 
looking at different ethnicities so much as uh, geographic locations. And what we found, they used relative tasks and um, absolute tasks. And Asians are better at one and Americans are better at the other, but they're very different. Do you see how on the left the performance is very wide? But as they move up the HSP scale, the more sensitive they are, the more alike they are. Until you get to this point over to the right where people who are highly sensitive, the cultural differences are almost voided by the sensitivity. This has, here's the absolute task, it's almost exactly the same. And this has profound implications for our world cultures and how, who is it that can bring us all together but the highly sensitive people. Here's another one. 18 newlyweds were scanned, and this study has also been rep, uh, repeated and, um, and the same results in many different studies. They're viewing photos of their partners and of strangers displaying positive, negative, or neutral facial expressions. And what happens is the highly sensitive people have a greater response to all of them. Okay, do you get that? That's the empathy and the strong emotional reactions. We have a higher response to all kinds of emotional representation, but it's stronger in our partners. Here's something that's really interesting to me. While we are more strongly reactive to all emotional representations and um, expressions, we actually, and this is surprising, we have a stronger reaction to positive than we do to negative. And maybe you are, or you know a highly sensitive person and you think this person is always negative or they're way more negative than they are positive. In fact, it feels that way because they're processing everything all the time, so you hear a lot more than you need to hear. But in fact, our brains are more reactive to positive input. It's a beautiful thing. Here's some other research, and since we're at Google and YouTube, I wanted to really focus on work, the workplace research. Since, uh, probably everyone who's watching here today on National Mental Health Day is um, watching from work, we are more affected by stress in the workplace. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? Bright lights, pressure to get projects done, um, who knows, the lighting, the whatever it is, the commute. We experience more stress in the workplace. Uh, there's a new study of HSPs who are working internationally, who are given an international assignment. They actually are the best employees to be sent overseas, but they last the shortest amount of time because of the pressure and the stress of adapting to the new environment. So although we are perceiving stress and it gives us a lower well-being, HSPs tend to be rated with a higher performance rating by their supervisors. You know, all that deep processing comes in handy and it makes you a very good employee. And it makes you good at your job, whether you're working in a, a large business or as a solopreneur. Here's the good news. This is the research I love the most. Um, Belsky and Pluis discovered, they're researchers in England, and they discovered um, this concept of differential susceptibility. All it means is that our brains are, have a different level of susceptibility to our environments. That makes sense, right? It's also called vantage sensitivity. So originally they thought that if you have this more reactive brain, it's an advantage only in certain situations. Like say only when you're supporting someone who's having strong emotions. But actually it's an advantage in all, it's generally an advantage in all situations. Um, so this research was really exciting because it means that with just a little bit of help and intervention, we can make a huge difference in the life of an HSP. So here's one of the studies that helped, them, helped everyone discover differential susceptibility. They took these uptight babies in the rhesus macaque population in a, um, another enclosure where this, the, um, these monkeys are, are studied. And when they took the uptight babies, the difficult babies, remember the earlier research from 1968 on human babies and young children, and they assigned them to skilled mothers, they cross-fostered them with skilled mothers, these were the advantages that happened. They had developmental precocity, they had a resilience to stress, and they became the leaders in their families. So when they weren't, 
in skilled parenting or a low stress environment as babies and growing up, they actually had more injury and illness. And they didn't fare nearly as well as the other, the larger percentage, the 80%. So we call them the orchids. Like an orchid requires a lot of TLC to keep it alive. So if you go out and buy an orchid and take it home and you just put it in the middle of your kitchen table and you water it like you would any cut flowers, it will die quickly. It needs southern exposure. It needs not to be watered as frequently as you might think. It has to have just the right kind of care. And I mentioned how beautiful this orchid was uh, before we started and I said, who's taking care of this orchid? And I, under, I was told that an entire team of people are here to take care of these plants. And that's really what an HSP might need. So here's another way that they discovered differential susceptibility. This is a graph. You can see family stresses on the bottom and behavioral problems, severity, is on the, the left. And wouldn't you expect if there's stress in a family that the children would have more behavior problems? It just makes sense, right? But this does not show that. Although the line is the correlation, it does go up a little bit. That's not what we would expect with really significant family stress. We would, I mean, I personally, and I think most of you would too, expect there to be a lot of behavior problems. If there's severe poverty or violence or mental illness or even marital conflict. So the scientist said, why is this not computing? It just doesn't make sense. So then Tom Boyce and others separated out the highly reactive brains with the low reactive brains. And what they found was the difference here that the orchid children, they're the magenta line, the orchid children in a low stress environment growing up had way fewer behavior problems. This is uh, pre-syndromal psychopathology that, that he was studying here, but he studied many different uh, variables. It doesn't matter what's on the left. It can be illness, injury, behavior problems. This is early uh, signs of future mental illness. If an orchid child or a highly sensitive child is raised in a low stress environment, they have way fewer problems than a dandelion child. If they're in a high stress environment, and this one again is marital conflict, but it doesn't matter what the stress is, they have way more problems. So this is the thing that's a little aggravating for me as an orchid that just kind of makes me wish sometimes I could be a dandelion. Look at the dandelion line. It's practically horizontal. You know what that means? Dandelions are almost not impacted by family stress or childhood stress. Wow. Now you can go, you can see why it's so important that we have 80% of any population that is going to be minimally impacted by stress, that are gonna be able to muscle through, take their sword out in the world and fight their way and you know, keep everything functioning. At the same time, we need these canaries as well. The ones who alert the family, the community, the culture, the species to signs of stress and the negative impact that they have. So here it is in just a slightly different graphical representation. An adverse childhood environment results in a strong path to negative results, negative affect, problems for a highly sensitive person, but a weak to moderate path for the 80% world, the dandelions. Here's the good news. I'm sorry I've depressed you. I know if you're highly sensitive that that's hard to hear. And, the, and most of us did have stressful childhoods. It's in Western, Western cultures, it's just really not a friendly place to raise a sensitive child. Even the regular public school day is challenging for a highly sensitive child. They come out of it exhausted and overstimulated. So most highly sensitive children in the Western cultures grow up feeling overstimulated and stressed by childhood. But it, it actually, it's okay, you adults, because see the bottom line? Any intervention at any age creates a strong path to great benefits. That's great. That means if you do yoga, you have good nutrition, you take naps, you close your eyes for 30 seconds before you get out of your car, you meditate, 
you get body work, uh, whatever it is that you do. I, I, those are some things that I do, but anything that you do that's self-care, you keep your blood sugar even, that's a big one for me, then you're going to experience great benefits. And guess what? Therapy is also a great uh, tool, and I'll get to that in a moment. So why do highly sensitive children thrive? These are pictures of me. And although I grew up in a typical American family, I did grow up on a farm. And so the great benefit to me was that I spent time in nature and I had a lot of responsibilities. So I got to get out of, away from my little sisters and the chaos of young children in the house. The older I got, the more responsibilities I had. I spent time in nature and with animals and that's a great thing. And if you can do that for yourself, it's great as well. And if you have a child who has some of these experiences, then they can thrive as an adult. Uh, here's one more study I threw in for you because I just think it's fascinating and it's something that impacts my family, um, that highly sensitive people make better gambling decisions because we have a more responsive attitude toward risk and we're more likely to recon recognize opportunities. So uh, my dad's a Texas Hold'em player and he and I both day trade. So those are both places where we use our sensitivity to be successful. Here we go, this is the, the, the book that I'm writing. It'll be out early next year, the HSP Five to Thrive. So there are just a few things that we need to do in order to thrive, whether our childhood was uh, stressful or not. The first is to believe this trait is real. So I hope that the fact that you're here means that I'm convincing you that this is an innate trait that 20% of over 100 species are born with. It's a huge number of people. The research is extensive on the brain and the different areas of the brain that are more activated by having the trait, being born with it. It's really important that we have these people. They're the ones, is there anyone who in say in California, when we've had the fires, who was the first person to be bothered by the smoke in your family or community, right? You notice the smoke. I was that person, I'm like, I need a mask. And you know, you walk out around and we had a lot of smoke and in the Bay Area of California. And you'd walk around and you'd see all sorts of people everywhere on the streets, not wearing masks at all. And then there'd be those few freaks with the big masks on. And those were probably the highly sensitive people because they really felt the impact. So I'm showing you that the trait is real. You, so you need to know if you're highly sensitive that you have the trait and to believe it's real. That is the first step and it's, it's an easy one to do. You can take Elaine Aaron's self-test that she developed and um, it's in the book and it's also um, where Anthony mentioned and on the website hsperson.com. And once you believe it's real, then you're more likely to take care of yourself. And that's number two, to design a life that's compatible with being highly sensitive. Now for parents and uh, partners of highly sensitive people, sometimes it's a pain in the behind to have to design a life that's compatible with somebody being highly sensitive, right? You just wanna go. You just wanna go out to the concert. You just wanna get up at the last possible minute, get everybody in the car, drop them at school and get to work. None of this deep processing, slow transitions business. And um, designing a life that's compatible with being highly sensitive is some, involves some of those things I mentioned before, that kind of self-care and spending a little more time getting places so that you have time to do the deep processing. Now, I, like, I look back on my own childhood and I say that something that really bugged me was birthday parties. I hated them. I was that freak child who never wanted to go to the birthday party. And I'm dating myself, but in my era of childhood, the way we played musical chairs was it wasn't just that you had to get a chair, that can be overstimulating anyway, but we had to sit on a balloon and pop it to keep our chair in musical chairs. And that just, those popping balloons sent me over the edge. Luckily, I had a highly sensitive mom who got it and didn't force me to go to the parties. And, but, you know, I have to say that I probably sometimes forced my highly sensitive son to go to them because it just seems like that's what makes ch childhood happy, right? So I look back on that and I thought, and w before I, I've always thought of myself, before Elaine Aaron told me I was highly sensitive, I always thought of myself as having something wrong with myself, that I couldn't just be out in the world doing everything I wanna do. And in fact, I look back and I'm like, oh, 
I'm highly sensitive. My brain was more reactive to all of that stuff. And actually, I had a great instinct. It wasn't a place I wanted to be. I wanted to be out on the ranch building a fort in the creek where my only rule was be home by dark. So that instinct was um, such a good thing. So I can reframe my childhood and my past in light of the fact I was highly sensitive. I can see some of those conflicts that I had as perfectly normal for somebody with a more reactive brain. The fourth five to thrive is to heal from past trauma. And I already mentioned that I really, I feel pretty strongly that childhood in the Western world is traumatic for highly sensitive children. It's just our expectations for the fast life that we're living now is really hard. And very few children today, and especially in urban areas, get to grow up the way that I did. And you know, I attended the first open classroom elementary school in Henrietta, Oklahoma. And it was a great thing because although there wasn't a lot of structure, I was allowed to go find a quiet corner to do my work. I just had so many advantages that I'm so grateful for, but not everyone gets it. And so we have to be able to heal from past trauma. And with children, we want to prevent it. So when something really traumatic happens, we want to talk about it and process it right then. And probably most people know that the best way to heal trauma is with a skilled therapist. So I don't want to send you out there on your own thinking I'm going to heal all those traumatic experiences on my own. That can be re-traumatizing, but a skilled therapist can be very helpful. The fifth of the five to thrive is to know other highly sensitive people if you're highly sensitive. And this makes sense because it's part of resiliency research. We know that people who are in some way different than their majority community that they're living in need to know others like them. So it's, it's a very challenging life to, be, to feel unique, to feel terminally different, to never really feel like there's anyone like you. And so this is why it's so important for highly sensitive people to know other highly sensitive people so you don't feel like a freak all the time. And um, so it's important to find those communities. And that is the five to thrive for highly sensitive people. Thank you. How often do you open floor office plans come up in your conversations? <laughs> open floor office plans. You know, it's like the open classroom. It can be so overstimulating because of the noise all the time. And at the same time, it's more freedom that you're not, you don't have to be necessarily always in a certain place. So. It's, it requires, if you know you have the trait, then you know how to work, you can figure out how to work with it. And we always like to tell highly sensitive people to become the most valuable person on your team so that you can negotiate with your supervisor or your business to create the things that you need. And um, so to be able to uh, go into a quiet corner and take care of yourself, at the same time, we often recommend to uh, highly sensitive teenagers, and I can say this for adults as well, um, to use noise canceling headphones, for example, so that you're there and you're present, but you can block out some of the overstimulation. So it, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a blessing and a curse, I think. We have an online question as well. This one says, any advice for those of us who may be married to an HSP and when we get home from work, then dinner, then kids to bed, she's exhausted slash overwhelmed and just wants time to herself. How do you build a relationship when there's no energy or focus left to share with the spouse? Oh, it's so hard. And, you, and you've been out at work all day and you think, oh, she's been home all day and um, you're ready to engage with the children. And I, I know there's a story in my family that my dad would come home from work and get me all riled up, wrestle with me and toss me in the air and get me all riled up. And then my, my, my mom couldn't get me to sleep and she was so worn out from having been with me all the time because I was one of those difficult babies. So um, the, the highly sensitive parent or partner who's at home with the children all day, she has to have self-care. And I'll never forget that uh, when I had a young child, I looked for yoga class, um, every kind of meeting or activity that I wanted to do, I only went places with childcare, for example. So the partner, the, the parent, stay at home parent with, who's highly sensitive needs to design a life that's compatible. And the person who's the dandelion who's at work can help support that. 
At the same time, I know you come home from work and you're tired, but to give the person who's highly sensitive time to get out of the house and go sit quietly, you know, the, there are two places that we recommend most for highly sensitive people, your car and the bathroom. And just to, you know, those are two places that you're allowed to go and people aren't allowed to interrupt you. Like strangers usually will not knock on your car door when you're hiding in your car with your eyes closed. So, but it's also, of course, great to go sit next to a redwood tree in nature if you have that ability. So we need to give those partners an opportunity to have self-care alone away from the children, both during the day and maybe right at the end of the day. And then they can recharge and be more available to you. Kind of related to the question about open offices, if you're designing for teams or groups of people, given the dynamics of like, the percentages of highly sensitive people versus dandelions, how can you optimize for both set types of people? Well, you know, I saw this beautiful design where um, they were putting these phone booths in the middle of the open workspace. And they were places that you could pull blinds down if you wanted to. And I think that it's so important to have the getaways. And you know, the research on extroverts, not even highly sensitive extroverts, just extroverts in general, is that they are more overstimulated and overwhelmed than the introverts because introverts are more likely to pursue time alone. So when you have these sort of uh, you know, closets, <laughs> when you have breakout places that are quiet zones, low light, you know, places ch to chill, whatever you might creatively call them in your workplace, then everyone can make use of them. And here's something that you can look at any environment. The highly sensitive person, what they are bothered by or experiencing and what they need for intervention is usually what everyone would benefit from. So uh, I'll give you a child example. In the preschool, when, one when the highly sensitive child, one child starts to scream, because it's too loud and, and worked up in the classroom and they get overstimulated and then that means that everybody is starting to feel on edge. So the highly sensitive person is your canary and if there's someone on your team who's saying the lights are too bright, the pressure's too much, there's nowhere to get away and take care of myself, then that person is probably giving voice to things that are living in the entire team. Um. So I've always been told my whole life that I'm too sensitive. Um, so when I heard about HSP, I, I was like, aha. Um, <laughs> but I especially felt it um, last year. I had a pretty severe concussion, and I was very sensitive to light and sound. And I was questioning you know, how much of that had I had formally, and how much of that is my brain recovering from the, the trauma. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit more about um, the brain, I know you were saying before that there was more um, research you could delve into. Yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. So the, you've got two parts to your question there. One is about trauma as well as the brain. And trauma activates the brain in a similar way that the trait of sensory processing sensitivity or highly sensitive people activate the brain. So when you get two things going on at the same time, it's extremely challenging. Um, you know, if you look at veterans and other survivors of trauma and people with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, we see that they look like highly sensitive people because they are more sensitive to their environment because of the trauma. So um, both people need, but when you have both going on at the same time, the recovery period has to be way more protected and often longer. In fact, we're slow, highly sensitive people are slower to develop, slower to recover. However, we recover better if we do everything that we need to do. So when the brain gets, you already have a highly reactive brain, when the brain gets further activated by a brain injury, a traumatic brain injury, then it's very, very important to give it that, that settling and quiet that it needs. I remember, um, there was a, there's a lot of talk uh, among athletes about concussions and brain injuries. And in the schools, uh, when a child, a minor, gets a brain injury, the rules for what they have to do, what they have to abstain from, um, are just, they seem really radical. 
like, you know, no stimulation and no input at all for a period of time and, you know, almost sometimes months before they can get back on the court or the field. And that's what a highly sensitive person needs is that level, the way we would protect our children with a concussion, for example. Thank you. And then we have another question online, and this one says, I come from a family that just says what they think out loud. I'm now realizing that my partner is an HSP and comments and thoughts that were normal to me to say out loud have mm -hmm. been hurtful to her. She's distanced herself from me emotionally to protect herself. How do you think I can overcome that or what advice can you give? You know, it is, it's so great for HSPs to be with partners who are not highly sensitive. It's also great for HSPs to be partnered together they have their own unique challenges. So the fact that you're not highly sensitive, it sounds like, is a gift to your family because you can monitor what you're doing and you can recognize when she's feeling challenged. But I like to think of it as um, you know, the bucket gets full. There are probably some times when you can say whatever to a highly sensitive person and they're an optimal level of arousal and they think, ah, oh, that's just you. And then there are times when they're exhausted and overstimulated and the comment is just way too much. It's really important to be able to modulate. At the same time, the highly sensitive person in a partnership has a responsibility to do her own self-care so that her bucket isn't full and so that every little thing is not taken personally. And I'm going to say, speaking from experience, it's hard not to take things personally. It really is. I have so much compassion for that and empathy. And at the same time, we have to be able to, to, sometimes a couples therapist is so helpful to help you identify what is personal and what isn't. And to just to build that fence, it doesn't have to be a concrete wall that's 20 feet tall, but a fence between you so that you say, ah, this is your acre and this is my acre. And when you're saying that, it's just you and you're still loving to me and I need to go take some self-care. You know, I like to coach couples to, um, to have a sort of a policy, I'm not gonna say a rule, a policy in their couple that when they are struggling with something, that if any person in the couple, either person in the couple starts to feel overstimulated, like your heart rate's coming up, you're feeling stressed, you're feeling hurt and angry, to take a time out. And it's not, you know, you want to say, I'm, I don't want to talk about this. It's not that. It's to say, I can't talk about this anymore right now. I'd like to take a break. Can we come back to it in an hour? So to really practice self-care is the responsibility of the highly sensitive person. To practice loving care is the responsibility of the dandelion partner. Conflict is one of my biggest anxiety triggers. What advice would you give to HSPs if conflict is an expected part of our job, especially if we are expected to move up in the job ladder by persuading colleagues who are strongly opinionated and or maybe opposed? And or maybe what? Opposed. Opposed, yeah. Um, I'm triggered by conflict too, and, um, and it's really hard, but I bet you anything that to be saying the same thing over and over again just because it's so true and so important that if you are at your optimal level of arousal, you can manage those folks. So here are some tips that we use that are so important for highly sensitive people in many situations, even in conflicts with your partner. This can apply to some of the other questions as well. Practice. Really develop a plan. Imagine or even write down every opposition that could possibly come up and practice a response to it. Write out a response to it so that when you're in the conflict, it's not hitting you new. Because have you noticed that it takes longer for you to come up with the response? Like I always have a great comeback for everything three minutes or 30 minutes or three days after the conversation happened. So to really prepare, here's, the, here's another thing that's so important. I like to tell HSPs that we need to come out about our sensitivity. We need to tell our supervisors, our employers, and even our teams about high sensitivity. And how do you say that? You say, you may have noticed that some people have stronger feelings or more reactions to certain things. And I'm one of those people. The plus side is that I'm really thinking about what's going on. 
and my problem solving is deep. And I can guarantee your team recognizes that, that when you come up with the solutions or um, a strategy, that it's very well thought out. And it's even hard to find the loopholes in it because you've thought about it and worked on it so hard. So being prepared for those situations, it's also really a great tool whenever possible to negotiate with the person who's in charge of whatever meeting is happening when you're, when you're hashing out whatever the proposal is or the, pro the project that you've been working on, to limit the time of it and to put a break in it or to schedule this meeting over two different periods, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, or two subsequent days, so that you have time to go back and process the information that's been coming in and get your rebuttals, your responses ready so that you're not overstimulated when you're trying to do it. Um, it's a little bit weird in the meeting, but again, if you can just take a breath and even close your eyes for a couple of moments, it will help you reset.